the same symbol. Okay. Um, so, uh, I don't even know where to start. I guess I should start with the Facebook Live. Um, so, I went to, finally went to the doctor the other day. And I guess I have a inner ear infection. Mm -hmm. They gave me a lot of antibiotics, sucked all that stuff out of my ear. And so, okay. I'm a... Uh, and I have changed my yogurt. I'm I'm doing cashew yogurt. I got to figure out how to make it now, but uh, <laughs> it's coming. I have had um, dishes where they have substituted. Um, I forget the where they substituted the sauce with cashew sauce. Huh. And sometimes cashew garlic sauce. It really is. If you learn how to make it, I don't know, but it's 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 really tasty. Really tasty. I've got to figure it out. Um because you know, part of I, I love the idea of making my own and knowing everything that goes into it to the extent that I can. Yeah. So I know people who actually make um, like their own almond milk and yes, and have figured out how to do their own plant-based cheeses, things like that. I don't know that I'm going to go that far, but I do, um, I'm excited about figuring all that out. So I'll keep unpacking it. It's interesting to to learn those things. I I attended a plant based diet seminar maybe about eighteen years ago, and mm -hmm. they uh, showed how to make almond milk. And it was when you use fresh almonds, it was really very very tasty. It's just for me, um, labor intensive. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, the only thing is, is if it doesn't last for a long time, it really, that kind of bothers me. But if I can make things like, and then it lasts me for a few weeks or something like that, yeah. that's great. But if I've yeah. got to do it every day, yeah, I can see the labor intensive part of it. So, okay. Um, I, you know, um, I get so excited about these conversations. Um, we talked a, uh, quite a bit about the third chakra, that Manipura, um, Manipura, Manipura, um, the solar plex chakra, um, partly because that is my area that I'm supposed to be focused on. But in uh, other parts is, is that that's the transition that's you know that's our our transition point into what some might call the higher level chakras so um so I'm, I'm excited too about talking about this heart chakra um and i know that people we uh, people in general still have a lot of work sometimes to do in that in that self-esteem kind of leadership chakra um, to own their own stuff, you know, to stand in that. Um, and, and of course, we talked a little bit about that last week as we talked about, I mean, we talked about so much um, as far as the wellness summit and um, all of those things. And so now we move into this area of the heart. Um, and I think we touched on the heart a little bit last week, but not, um, you know, we keep getting distracted by stuff. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's, um, as you're pointing out, it's as you move up the, sh as you move up through the different chakras, you start to approach higher and higher levels of consciousness. And so we were talking about the heart chakra, you know, um, the heart chakra and Manapura share certain qualities. Manapura, of course, is that solar plexus chakra. So, you know, and that solar energy is that hot, fiery energy that allows us to take a stand in our life and be sovereign. 
in our life. <clears throat> and so it is also the source of courage. And that's another aspect of the heart chakra also. But in Anahata, it is having that empathy, having that ability to actually not feel sorry for other people, but to actually experience what they're experiencing because the understanding there is we are one, that we have this in in interdependence. And the thing is, when you look at the diagram, the um, Hindu diagrams of the chakras, you will see a symbol of uh, feminine energy. Um, many times it's a downward pointing triangle. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll also see a symbol that is somewhat phallic in nature or an upward pointing triangle, meaning that there are, <clears throat> there are two things, two important things at play in any chakra. And that is that there is this male quote unquote deity and a female quote unquote de deity. And so each chakra also in the picture in the diagram has petals around the circle. And the petals each contain a Hindu word. And it is, quote unquote, a word of power or a bija, B-I-J-A-A-C. And it is a sound. It is a sound wave that you can use that actually resonates with an aspect of that chakra. And so the work that you do on this chakra has to do with your ability to manipulate that sound pattern such that the male deity gives you information, gives you understanding, not an intellectual understanding, but an experiential understanding and changes your thought pattern about certain things so that I don't just talk about compassion and my compassion is related to a particular person. No, when my heart chakra is open, then my compassion is unbounded. I am a compassionate being. I'm not compassionate or empathetic to this person or this event or this thing. No, I am a compassionate person. The same thing about the female deity is it gives you the energy to operate in that stand. It gives you the ability to function as that being. So your thought pattern changes and your behavior changes. So when, when we're talking about working with, with, with the chakra, we're talking about using those sounds and then hopefully changing our behavior to be in alignment with that and the longer you operate with that behavior and the more you continue to do that, you actually demand the energy to go to that shock. You know, everything, energy follows a, a demand. And so that's the other aspect of having events in our life, real life events, which challenge us to behave differently. So now when I have the understanding of, oh, I should be compassionate. You know, simply because um, I have this earthborn idea that I'm different from this person or that they're my enemy. The intelligence of the chakra tells me, well, that's an illusion. They are, we are the same. And so when I really try to behave differently in that, I'm demanding energy to come to that chakra to support that behavior. And then if I sit in meditation long enough, chanting a bija, chanting a scene, I actually can actually um, bring forth more energy, more understanding, and be able to open it up and have it become a full flower so that now my behavior in life changes. Mm -hmm. So um, that's good. Uh, you brought out a lot of um, amazing points there. Um, the, the word that came to me is this having an intention towards something because you know um like i i do the chant for minds is rum you know yes. and i could feel it vibrating in my body as a matter of fact and i That's pay right. attention to as i chant 
even where I feel it because it is a vibrational energy. And so a lot of times I feel it more so on the left side of my body with this resonance. And I'm not exactly sure what that means. But what I do know is, is what happens is that I tend to call forth more experiences that, that put me right in confrontation with real life stuff. So you said um, intellect versus experiential. So intellectually, I can read about things in the book and know them in my mind, but actually putting it into practice, seeing it, you know, it, what is it? Is it not, it's not 3D, it's 4D or something like that? <laughs> right, right. Whole in my life coming up as something is a different type of, of, of feeling. You know, that's our, um, our Western acculturation is that we, we, we think, we think that because we understand the words, we know the reality. Mm -hmm. I can look at a picture book and I see the word tree. Okay, so I know what a tree looks like. Okay, and I, you know, and I can read the the definition a plant that has roots it's got a woody surface and it has leaves etc cetera, etc cetera. but now if i'm running through the woods and i run smack dab into a tree i have a completely different experience of the tree than when i read it mm -hmm. if i decide that you know i'm hungry and there's no plants around okay so let me shave off some of this bark and try oh i've got a different experience of what a tree is I'm standing underneath the tree and all of a sudden something, you know, if it has fruit, bounces off my head. Oh, now I'm getting a real experience of what a tree is as opposed to the intellectual understanding of the word that defines a reality. We mix that up. The Western world is full of definitions, but actual experiences we don't have the technology to induce the experience. And that's what older cultures have. That's what rites of initiations were, giving you a certain experience of what your role as a woman in this group, or your role as a man in this group, which is different from saying, okay, these are your chores, these are your functions, these are how you operate. No, we need you to go out here. Now we're going to support you, but we're going to give you a spear and point out a line. And you're going to go kill the lion because we need you to be a fearless hunter. Now, that's a completely different experience from, yes, um, we need you to be a hunter and you're going to provide protection and food for the tribe. Well, when it's you face to face with the spear and a roaring lion and you've got your whole group around you, that's a different understanding of what this means. Yeah, you know, um, and, and that example is today is really interesting. Um, there is a 2D version, you know, like you read it and you may learn something else. There's a 3D version, and then there is this lived experience. And um, I have, I, I marvel at, you know, they have these little, um, things about parenting these days, helicopter parents and bulldozer parents and parents that try to take away the challenges and suffering of their children with the notion that they're doing um, that intercession is good without realizing that it could be crippling. So that it is a crippling, you know, it, it's it's that whole idea of being too too sterile, you know, cleaning your hands all the time, cleaning everything around you, such that well, at least at, as a child, such that they never get the opportunity to form the antibodies that are really their true protection, because you've kept them away from an environment where they can get exposed to certain things. And that's the same thing. Remember, I, I believe we had a con conversation at some point about the uh, idea of um, ministers' children 
and mm -hmm. how sometimes they are really sheltered and protected, you know, as they're coming up and then they go out of state to a college and because they have no real life experience with temptation, now all of a sudden they have difficulty in navigating and negotiating certain events in life that are going to come their way, which is going to expose them to things that they've never been exposed to before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so <laughs> this idea of allowing life to teach us, I think is an important one. So with your example of a tree, the idea of what, you know, it's, it, it being immovable, firmly rooted, you know, the, what it's like, whether or not it gives fruit, whether or not it's climbable, all of that stuff, but to sit in meditation under a tree, that's where Buddha received his enlightenment is, is yet still another experience that the awareness that Jesus was hung on a cross that was made out of a, out of a tree is yet another experience. The idea of strange fruit on a poplar tree is yet another experience. And so we've got all of these divergent ways of, of, of encountering the same thing um, through different perspectives, whether it is protecting you from the sun or, you know, or providing um, some type of barrier or something. All of these are different experiences. And to think that we know something just based on what we've read or somebody else's experience can show us um, that maybe we may be missing out on a whole lot if we are just going with what we think we've learned. We're, we're missing out on the reality and we are being satisfied with, with, with a representation, with a symbol, with a symbol of the reality, which is what the word tree is. It's a symbol of the reality. Mm -hmm. So now let me ask you this. If we looked at the heart as a symbolic of something, what can we, how can we think about it? the heart is center? How can we think about the heart in a, in a bigger way than just saying, oh, it's a muscle? <laughs> well, I mean, um, again, the, the, the two most common ones are among males and maybe among females too, because you were, you know, you pointed out to me last week women can be just as violent and i have certainly in the weeks since have seen certain episode certain um uh, uh, uh illustrations of, of that but men among men you know will tell each other he has no heart meaning no courage to face adversity head on and then the other part of the other part of having no heart being heartless means being cruel and not understanding and not in and and not having compassion so it is the seat of love but it is also the seat of courage so those would be the metaphors that i would use in terms of the energy that it has mm -hmm. So I, I remember my mother one time, my mother, you know, she grew up in the South and she described this woman as having a black heart. And I thought, ooh, what yes. is that, you know? Yeah. Right. A malicious person, mm. you know? Yeah. Mm. So the heart, um, the heart chakra resonates towards, um, as far as body parts, is the circulatory system, the lungs. It says here the arms, shoulders, ribs, breast, the diaphragm, and the thymus gland. For the heart? That's what I have, yeah. No, because the thymus gland is part of the immune system. 
Mm. It is a gland that's large in children, sits in the chest in front of the heart, actually. But as we get older, it shrinks and shrinks, but it is part of the immune system. Now, maybe what they're referring to is the circulation pattern that the heart is responsible for. So it sits in the center and then it throws out branches to the head, to the arms, to the thorax, the abdomen, and then to, to, to the legs. So it is the center of the circulatory system. Now, what is it circulating? It's cir circulating blood, but what's the function of the blood? The blood is to carry oxygen and prana. Where does that come from? That's the lungs. So that's how it is, in, it is intimately intertwined with the lungs and the pulmonary system. They work together to circulate prana, oxygen, and chi throughout the entire body. Okay, and so, so then it goes along with this. Oh, so, so wait a minute. I've cracked my, I cracked my book, and um, one of the things that I, I bought the, for those of you guys who don't know, I, I didn't bring it in here with me. Um, I purchased um, the book, um, and one of the things that it talked about was this idea of. Um, that a lot of times people think that the biggest threat to our health is like the cancers without recognizing that heart disease. It's still the number one killer. Yeah, is, is that. So it talks about this idea of physical dysfunctions of that heart chakra is congestive heart failure, um, myocardia, myocardial infraction which is a heart attack yes um mitral valve prolapse I'm not exactly sure about that so before you let me okay let me uh -huh. cardio cardio myalga megalia whatever however you say that asthma lung cancer bronchial pneumonia upper back and shoulders <laughs> and breast cancer so those would be the physical dysfunctions that it says that takes place in that area. Um, so just to, um, I, I don't want to get off on um, the China study to like from what I've read about it so far. I don't want to get too deep off in that because we'll talk about that later. But when I started thinking about this, the image that came up to me is, is that, um, that when we take a life for our consumption or our digestion, it's like it's attacking us back. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is an interesting and um, a valid way of looking at it, yes. <clears throat> so when so when they talk about this idea of um, of the the dysfunctions that happen when our heart is out of alignment, and still the number one killer is heart disease of, of what however it appears in that list. Um, what is that, that we have become a heartless nation? I mean, I mean is, is heart disease the number one killer throughout the world or is it? No, just no, it is, it is the number one killer in the Western world. Remember the Western world's animal ingestion is the highest of any geographic area. Other people do eat meat, absolutely. And they eat seafood, all kinds. But they don't make meals predominantly of meat. That's the difference. So if you go to a Chinese restaurant and what, 
And so you'll have all of these dishes of various kinds of rice and various kinds of vegetables. And then what you, they take, if you're with a Chinese family, a Chinese group, they take small portions of the meat to put with the rice and the vegetables or the noodles and the vegetables. They don't have a big steak. They don't have a big piece of lamb. They don't have a pork chop. They have small pieces of beef, small pieces of chicken, um, pieces of seafood, and they will mix it with the vegetables and the rice. Western world, because at, you know, um, because of how they have this relationship with the rest of the world and have soaked a lot of their wealth from the Western, from other parts of the world, can afford to take cows, a pigs, which are a less robust source of energy, feed them plants, get them big, and then sell them off for relatively cheaper prices than the rest of the world can afford to have meat. Because at one time, meat was considered to be the, you know, when, I don't know, when I, when I was young, if you were eating steak, you were eating very, very high up in the economic chain. So steak was a treat because it was considered the food of the wealthy. So, um, now they can grow these cows so big, so fast, get them to market, the price of steak has gone down. So everybody can have beef, Every, everybody can have pork, everybody can have chickens now. And that's what makes cardiovascular disease the number one because it is the, the protein of animals is not treated the same way in the body as the protein from fruits and vegetables and grains. Yeah. So the Western world and their, um, I, I want to use this idea of, um, I want to think about it, I, I guess in my mind, that there are so many people that are left-brained that see division rather than unity and therefore they can feed on life um, and life meaning animal life whatever however that may appear um, as opposed to seeing it as part of a a larger system and that idea that ideology seems to be attacking us, if if I can put it in that kind of way. So um, and so what happens is I think if we are never really conscious about because this to me goes to this idea of if if I'm thinking about division versus unity, <laughs> This is an idea of whether we can have dominance over. I, I mean, that's what that's what I'm getting. This idea of of dominance or might, might makes right, and to have power over things instead of participating with things. Well, and 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 it's also capitalistic greed, because don't forget, you know, the book, the China study is um, at least 10, 12 years old. Mm -hmm. So the knowledge and understanding of how animal protein affects the human body is not new. This has been out there for over a decade. For vegetarians, before the China study, understood the human body, our digestive system, is analogous to that of herbivores. It's not analogous to that of 
carnivores or mm -hmm. meat eaters. Mm -hmm. So understood that my body is designed for a particular kind of diet. So we can ignore that because we have free will and we can eat whatever it is that we want to. I remember a time when Oprah Winfrey went after the meat industry, remember? Yeah. And they sued her in Texas because she was so popular and had so much influence that meat beef consumption dropped after her show on the, on, on the harmful effects of eating um, beef and pork. Mm -hmm. They sued her and she's never done another show like that again. Mm -hmm. So what is this? They understand that this is harmful to the public, not just the farmers, but the government and the government scientists. But it is still not talked about in such a way and taught in schools at an early age. Yes, if you want to eat meat, you can have some meat, but understand if you want to have a life of quality and longevity and health and wellness, your consumption should be minimal to none, small amounts to none. Mm -hmm. But the greed and the way our democracy is set up with the corporate influence um, over the policymakers, you know, uh, none of this is acted upon for the benefit of the American health. Yeah, I agree because, you know, even, um, you know, even with me going through the challenges with my ears, I recognize that it is not just my ears are not an isolated thing, but that because I've been on this yogurt journey, um, yogurt is mucus caused. Mucus, that, that is correct. It, it causes the mucus. And so the mucus then gets into my ear, nose, and throat area, which then causes me to have this congestion, um, blowing my nose and, and dealing with the effects of the mucus that, um, that that's generated. And so now I am dealing with, by taking antibiotics and stuff, the, the, the consequences of that choice. So while, yes, yogurt on one hand may have been good, for me in one way, it has had its effects. And so I have to look at and deal with the side effects of, um, of some of the choices that I've made. And but so- it's beautiful I'm, that you were exposed to a certain kind of understanding such that when the problem occurred, oh, okay, I know what's causing this and I'm willing to attempt to change. But think about so many of the people that you know of, certainly a lot of the people that I see on a regular basis all the time, who don't associate what's going on in their bodies, what's going on in their minds, what's going on in their spirit with their diets. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so I'm making corrections and I, I recognize that um, for me, I don't desire to be on medications, any of them for any long-term basis to deal with a, something that I can choose to put in my body or not. So I can choose not to have cream in my coffee. I can choose not yeah. to eat yogurt. I can choose not to have, um, cheese. I can choose I can make yeah. choices. We are designed to do hard things. <laughs> and, and because of our very essence, peaceful by nature with preferences, our preferences are learned. My father was a big coffee drinker. So I, I learned to drink coffee like my father, cream and sugar. By the time I was an intern, I recognized the debilitating effects of cream and sugar. So I decided to start drinking black coffee. And it was, uh, it, was, it, it, it was not that palatable at the beginning. But my mindset was that 
the caffeine really jump starts my brain function and it really helps my thoughts flow. So I'm going to learn to like it like this. And now that's the only way that I can drink coffee is black. Mm -hmm. No cream, no sugar. Um, in the wintertime, I'll use raw honey because of the antibiotic effect of the honey. It's, it's just another way of helping my immune system. But basically, it's black coffee. My point is that we can learn to like what we don't like if it's good for us. Mm -hmm. Because we didn't come to this world with any of these things already programmed. We learned to like salt. We learned to like sugar. We learned to like fat. And now once you come into the understanding, oh, but this is, but this is why my joints ache. This is, this is why, you know, I can't do this anymore. This is why. And I've seen my sister, my, my mother, my father have these health issues. I'm going to change what I do. And I'm going to learn to like what's healthy. You know, this is so good because, you know, when we, we started out talking about this heart chakra and what the heart chakra means, we've kind of made a detour over here in this, but I was thinking to myself as I was listening to you, this is about us loving our bodies as well. This is it's, about us loving life as well. It's not a detour it's because not. one of the things that, so there is this ritual that the Egyptians um, have, and it's called the weighing of the heart ceremony. And what that is, is has your behavior in the world shown that you are peaceful and loving and law abiding? If your heart is, so they weigh it against the feather. Mm -hmm. And the feather is very, very light. So it means that if you've got a lot of emotional turmoil, that weighs you down. It causes your heart to become heavy, a heavy hearted person. I'm angry. I'm frustrated. I'm grieving. I'm sorrowful. I get triggered very easily. All of those things produce weight in the heart. And so your diet has a lot to do with your reactions. And so they're not that, you know, this is, this is, you know, as you talked about, there's this holistic view of life. We, you know, there's so many factors involved in how we think, act, behave, and emote that you can't just attack it just at one piece at a time. It's all of these. Now you can choose like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna do this now, I'll do this later, I'll do, do, do this later but you've got to be able to involve all aspects of your being. And so this heavy hearted thing, yes, it is about, I like this and I don't like that. Yes, I'm not going to take any herbs because they're bitter. Even though the turmeric and the ginger and the onion may clear the mucus out, or you know what, I like this and therefore I'm going to keep doing this even though I know the consequence to it. The, the, the fallback is you got to die with something. Yes, you could die in sleep. You don't have to die from, you don't have to die from a disease. And in fact, you know, there's a high grade level of Buddhist monks who can anticipate their death and they die in meditation. They know the end is coming. So they sit and meditate and they transition mm -hmm. while they're in meditation. And so you can choose all these things and not be weighed down by the preferences that you have, which are harmful, or as you say, I don't love myself enough. I don't, I don't love actually God enough to change the temple that I want God to come into. Mm, mm, that's good, that's good. <laughs> You know, um, and and to think that people can be so disconnected from anything on this planet as to assume that a, a cow doesn't have fear or a desire to live. 
Um, I mean, one of the, the main impulses we talk about is this self-preservation. And we think that it is only a human quality rather than a life quality. We get it from ours comes from the animal world, mm -hmm. survival, the, mm -hmm. the need to survive. Oh, my gosh. And so when we think about that, um, a cow or a pig or a chicken or whatever being led to slaughter, or just being raised in order to be eaten, that seems to come from a heartless place or a, a black hearted place. <laughs> I'll put it that way. I don't even like that term though. Um, but it comes to a-, a Yeah, because a it implies that blackness is, is evil and bad. Right, right. I don't <laughs> like that term. It just felt wrong coming out. So yeah, so it is just coming from a place where we're not connecting and recognizing um, that that desire to live, that, yeah, just that. So, um, and then the other part of this, though, is, is that what I recognize, too, is, is that my body lives in the present. And so just like I can be forgiving towards other things, I am learning that our body is forgiving of us, too, for the places that we have violated it, its own energy, what's good for it, and can self-correct. So once we make a decision to move in the uh, in the direction of healing, that there is a response there too, and that is what forgiveness looks like to me. Um, that's beautiful. So at the Cleveland Clinic is a famous cardiothoracic surgeon, Dr. Esselstyn, who's written the books, and he was also in Knives Forks Over Knives. Mm -hmm. So he used to do, still still does, cardiac bypass and angioplasty, you're putting in stents. He's fixing blocked arteries in the heart because of the destruction of the vessels. And so he his book is that I watched over 20 years, the people that I did keep coming back to me with their vessels occluded something kicked in, there's got to be a different way. Fast forward, he goes into veganism, and then he starts to teach it and treat people by it, such that to your point of, the, of making an intention and the body forgiving of the sins that we've committed on it, he's been able to demonstrate over the course of nine or 10 months, a strict vegan diet that he can illuminate the arteries of the heart with dye, which shows initially them being blocked in certain areas using no medicine, only diet and exercise shows them to be wide open and fully functional at the end of a year simply by going on a vegan diet. So yes, our body will forgive us up to a certain point if we intentionally decide to love ourselves more, to love this temple that God gave us and love God enough to say, I want you to come in so I know I've got to clean up my act. I've got to operate in a way that befits me being a divine being. Mm, that's good, that's good. And so maybe we need to change the narrative around um, and, and this is this is a, something that not this going to happen overnight, but a gradual changing or shifting of even how we talk about that. I went to a um, they used to have these discussion groups out in Cleveland Heights or different places that would talk about neighborhood cultural issues. And I remember saying that one of my pet peeves was, this was one of my pet peeves, was people who barbecued on the front, in the front of their house. Like, you know, I used to, I don't know why, 
But it was like, yeah, you're supposed to barbecue in the backyard. You're supposed to barbecue someplace, but not out in the front yard. And so one of the speakers on the panel who was, you know, considered an activist, he was up there. I was in the audience. He gets up there and he says, I barbecue in the front yard because I want people to know I can afford meat. And I thought, what? (laughs) Well, (laughs) is that a question? (laughs) I don't know. And maybe you can afford a house. And if you can afford a house, you can afford a yard and you could go back there and barbecue. But to him, it was a status symbol. Yeah. And remember, that's what we had to talk about in the Western world. It used to be only the wealthy could afford meat. So he was still stuck in that in in that idea. And not only was he stuck in the idea that the meat was prestigious, his ego was not strong enough that he could just go ahead and barbecue in the back and eat meat. I need other people to validate that I am of a certain status. So what he's saying is my ego is not to the point where I can do this for me. I need other people to know I have enough money. Yeah. So changing around the narrative um, of, of what all of this looks like is, I think, the work to do. So I, um, I, I've had you on here um, for a minute now. I, I need to let you go. But let me first say before I end this um, that I started watching a program called Painkiller that is on Netflix Netflix and it is the story that you have given us about Purdue Pharma and Oxy- and the Sackler family and yes 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 and so when I mentioned at my brother's um little birthday gathering um the other day that I was watching painkiller somebody said have you watched dope dope um what is that thing called but there's an apparently another one out there um that's maybe aired on hulu that is about the same um family and that role that uh they have played in uh in pushing oxycontin heartless Heartless. <laughs> wow. Uh, it, this is it's fascinating, um, interesting. You say heartless. Um, the, the one guy kept talking about legacy and what legacy is that, that you can erase. Oh, it's called Dope Sick. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, it's called Dope Sick. Um, that you can erase the wrong that you've done somehow by paying attention to your legacy. Um, and yeah, so um, yeah, that is that is something to watch. Have you seen either or both of those already? Um, um, pain, painkiller is in my queue, so I have not watched it yet. But in terms of legacy, they've never acknowledged that they did this purposefully and that it was wrong. Mm -hmm. In that family, there are several physicians. So they are very astute at reading the studies that they commissioned, Mm -hmm. which showed how addictive this substance was and showed how um, they knew that it could be easily misused, yet and still they had their sales representatives telling physicians it is no more addictive than anything else out here, Mm -hmm. when they knew that it was. Mm, Yeah. Um, 
yeah, they knew that it was, um, knew the, you, all of the stuff, they were aware of it. And it, it, you know, part of it too, as I'm taking or been given medicine, to, to be honest with you, I can remember, um, I don't know if I was offered Oxycontin or if I got it and then gave it away. But I can remember um, something happening with me and having been um, having a prescription for it. Now, I will tell you, I have Tylenol 3 in there in my cabinet that is about 12 years old. Um, I get stuff. I've gotten prescriptions, gotten them filled and never taken them because I don't I'm not one that likes medication. Um, I looked in my cabinet to see if I stick because I don't I don't know why I don't throw away medication, <laughs> but I usually don't. It it'll sit there forever. And I know they say you're not supposed to flush it and you're not supposed to do it. I, it just sits there forever. I've got prescriptions from back in like uh, and shamefully, probably the late 90s. Um what are you gonna do with it? I don't know, nothing. They just sit there collecting dust. They just taking, up, taking up valuable space. <laughs> yes, yes, clutter. <laughs> <laughs> and I wonder what chakra that's dealing with that I got that I got clutter. But um, you know, it is so I've 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 had stuff and um and I just I don't, I don't even always finish all of my antibiotics, shamefully to say, because I just don't like taking medication. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, all of this is interesting. So whether it's dope st uh, sick or watching um, painkiller, I, I will say that um some of this really makes me leery of when people tell me to take something and it'll be all right. It's just like, uh, yeah. Well, you know, you, you have to be able to reason through it and weigh the pros and cons. Like you said, I have an ear infection. And if you had a method for fighting the infection without the antibiotic, you would have used it. But the antibiotic, you know, will take care of it. So um, it's for a, a short course. It's going to get me back to my balanced state. And so I'm going to go ahead and take it. You know, it's the same thing if you've got, let's say, sciatica, back pain, you know, and you've got this pain radiating down your back. Okay, so every now and then you use ibuprofen. Um, if acupuncture works, then you do that. If you if arnica works, then you do that. You know, we have to have the flexibility and adaptability, whether or not it's allopathic medicine, whether or not it is homeopathic medicine, whether or not it's herbal medicine, whether you know it's Ayurvedic herbs, you do what works. And the whole idea is keeping our minds, hearts, and spirits in balance so that the need for these things is minimal. We get out of balance all the time, but, you know, okay, so I, I know mudras to do. I know postures to do. I know um, sounds to make. I know breathing patterns that can help. But, you know, when my back acts up, I'm not opposed to taking an ibuprofen. You know, and if I have to, if I had pneumonia, yes, I'm going to take an antibiotic because if I had been on my game, I wouldn't have gotten the pneumonia in the first dog off place. So obviously there's a little deficiency somewhere, but the whole idea is those are temporary things. What we're trying to do is hopefully you don't have to stay on high blood pressure medicine for the rest of your life. If you have to, then that's better than having a stroke or a heart attack or kidney failure. That if you have diabetes, that we can fix your diet and your weight in such a way that you don't have to take it. You know, these chronic diseases that Western medicine helps us to maintain, not cure, maintain so that we die slowly rather than fast. That's what we're trying to change 
with diet, meditation, eating right, exercise, breathing practices, and emotional and spiritual equanimity. That's what we're trying to prevent. Yes, yes. And 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 that's a that's a good point to to end on. Had I recognized that my so eating yogurt, I did lose some weight around the the eating yogurt. I definitely have felt the benefits of it, but at the same time it came with something that has caused a buildup of mucus that caused this ear infection and all of that stuff. So yes, I was out of balance and I am moving in a direction to correct that. So I will take my antibiotics. Thank you for that lecture. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and Kimberly says that Cleveland Heights City Hall has a dispensary to get rid of drugs. And so- Thank you, Kimberly. Um, <laughs> yes, for that FYI. <laughs> So thank you so much. Um, next week, we'll move up uh, into the throat area and uh, so we can get to um, a little bit more, drill down a little bit more after we finish the chakra series into um, the China study. All right, my sister. Thank <laughs> Have you. an amazing weekend. And you too. Okay. Thank you. Right. Bye. Peace. Good, 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 good. Always amazing and good. So um, thanks for y'all for being here. And um, I will, I'll either see you in the morning or next Thursday at 11 for the next 33 years <laughs> with Dr. Brown. Take care. Have an amazing, amazing day. Bye.